All right, welcome to the next workshop in the Return to Freud. In this workshop, we are going to be covering two papers from 1912, one on the dynamics of transference and the other on the onset of neurosis. Um, these papers are um, of particular significance to methodological practice and psychoanalysis going into sort of detail and how in, in sometimes how emotionally difficult the entire process of analysis can be. Um, I think it also gives us insight into the types of dynamics, emotional dynamics um, that we experience outside of analysis in institutional settings in the the in our general social life. So I think that both of these papers have uh, far-reaching ramifications outside of just analysis. Um, they have ramifications for how we basically uh, develop emotional attachments in the world at large, I would say, um, and how our, and, and this is sort of a larger sort of moment, I think, in Freud's career where he is starting to um, bring in more philosophical dimensions of how the discoveries of psychoanalysis um, lead us to deeper understandings of our psyches and their relationship to the world at large. Um, so I think that's an, that's an important turn. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Will you share? And let's get into the first paper. So the first paper, The Dynamics of Transference from 1912, that image there you see is a, a, an image from a movie called The Secret Passion, which I, I, I recommend um, about, uh, about Freud's life and about the discovery of um, the unconscious and specifically how Freud stumbled onto the ideas of infantile sexuality. And the image you see there is basically uh, capturing this process of transference that can happen between a patient and the analyst uh, will get into sort of what that transference looks like and some of the some of the hurdles that it presents to analysis. So Freud starts off this paper by talking about how uh, how a subject comes to love is a combination of innate disposition, so our genetics basically, uh, that is our constitution and endowment, and also our early influences, which are more subject to accidental phenomena and chance. Um, and he wants to make, he makes a footnote in this paper about how um, in, in, in specifics, uh, he doesn't want psychoanalysis to get stereotyped as simply, um, I guess, suggesting that causation of neurosis is simply only from early influences in childhood that also innate disposition genetics do play a role. He specifically um, takes great lengths to articulate that there's a, a complex interaction between the two, basically. And this complex interaction between the two um, leads to the specific methods by which a subject will express love later in life. Um, and he, he goes into detail describing how um, the methods by which someone loves um, is a result of a type of stereotype plate, which uh, you can say here is a, an image. Um, and this image, um, again, a combination of genetics and early influences in childhood, um, becomes repeated and reprinted on external love objects um, that are accessible to the subject. So basically we have an image in our head of the type of other person who we want to share our love with. So the type of person we want to share our love with is actually something very specific, something very, um, very narrow in some sense. And, and this very specific stereotype plate um, is, is how we are sort of um, trying to externalize our love in relationship to the other. Now, he goes on to say that for most people, um, only a portion of these images, only a, a narrow, small amount of these images, let's say, um, have passed through psychological development um, and have become integrated into the conscious personality. And all of the other images 
um, which are just as 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 just as desired to be expressed in the external world, um, are withdrawn into unconscious fantasy. And here you have again the split consciousness, the split consciousness between the parts of our libidinal impulses, our erotic impulses, which have been integrated into the conscious personality, and the parts of our libidinal um, uh, desires and, and impulses which are. Uh, not eradicated, but withdrawn into the unconscious. So the unconscious libidinal concentration is held, he says, in anticipation in complex images like, he says, the father imago, the mother imago, the brother imago, the sister imago. These images, which have been formed from childhood, remain in the unconscious and they can attach onto the analyst in the process of analysis. And that is specifically what Freud is referring to as transference. Transference is when a image pattern in the unconscious um, basically is acting out onto the, the analyst in the process of analysis. Now, he says that transference is more intense in neurotic subjects and that there's a mystery of analysis, which is that the entire process of transference um, represents a resistance to cure in the analysis, yet it is a vehicle of cure outside of analysis. Now, I could speculate about why this is. Um, the first reason I would su suggest is that it's, it might not be so much of a cure as Freud is pointing towards, and, and I think he goes on to sort of hint, hint at this um, later in the paper, but basically the reason why it's a vehicle of cure outside of analysis, I think, is, be is because some of the unconscious libidinal attachment, um, potentially pathological, uh, is finding an outlet. Whereas in analysis, you have to uh, work through your bullshit to be, to be, you know, <laughs> to be precise. You, you have to um, recognize that you are projecting. You have to recognize that you are trying to work through infantile impulses um, and that those infantile impulses are attaching themselves onto an analyst. So I think that's one of the reasons why. And, and we'll go, go into a little bit of this more on this slide as well. Um, so just reiterating here this mystery um, about transference, that it is the most powerful resistance in analysis and yet a vehicle of cure in a way outside of analysis. Um, he suggests that it's the immense disadvantage of psychoanalysis um, that the strongest factor of success is changed into the most powerful medium of, of resistance. I would say that it, it I would almost disagree in a sense because I, I think that working through this medium of resistance is where you find the uh, deeper aspects of our subjectivity and that you could again be bypassing in some sense um, your infantile complexes um, by sort of um, just simply unconsciously projecting them onto another person. Um, and then he goes on to say, and in this sort of like leading, you know, here I think where Freud is, is sort of suggesting something similar, where he says, transference occurs in institutions all the time. Um, basically where we project daddy issues or we project mommy issues or we project brother and brother and sister issues onto the people we're, we're, we're working with, you know, onto our professors, onto our uh collaborators onto our work work partners um and he says that this transference occurs with an intensity in the un most unworthy forms and extends to nothing less than mental bondage where we become mentally bound to another person simply because we haven't worked through our infantile issues so again i think that the the so-called success of the transference in the institutional settings um, is in some sense a mental bondage which keeps us, I think, in a, in a, in a, a state of lower psychological development potentially. So he goes on to say, and this is what will connect it to the next paper, 
is that the onset of a psychoneurosis is basically, and this is a really important concept introduced by Jung, which is introversion. And this reflects what I was um, pointing towards in the first slide, namely that a portion of the libido um, capable of becoming, becoming is becomes incapable of becoming conscious and the direction towards reality is diminished. Namely that basically there's a, a blockage or a frustration. There's something about the libido that wants to be expressed um, and it can't because of, uh, we'll go into this in the next paper, either internal reasons, external reasons um, uh, and, and some other developmental reasons as well. Um, but basically the libido enters into a regressive course and has revived the subject's infantile imago. So you see here the image of the infant looking at the mother, you know, like when you kind of get like possessed by someone, if you get possessed by an image of someone, this is like uh, the revival of the infantile imagos. You know, like you're, 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 someone appears very shiny. Someone appears very special. Um, this is uh, the revival of the imagos here. And he's saying that when it becomes introverted into the subject, um, this is uh, where the problems of neurosis emerge. So the point of an analytic treatment is to track down the libido that has become introverted and to make it accessible to consciousness and serviceable to reality. So that's the double task. And this isn't to say, now this is against what Lacan would point out as the problem of institutional psychoanalysis becoming ego psychology, because the point of analysis is to track down the libido, um, which has become withdrawn from reality and to make it accessible to consciousness, serviceable to reality. And the point is, is we don't know how that will change the subject. Um, it may dramatically change the subject, um, their entire identity might have to go through a revisioning. And that's why, as we'll see in the next slides, there is so much tension and so much struggle about bringing the libido to consciousness because it would require a total change of identity, basically, or a possible major transformation of identity. So leading straight into that, there is an analytic struggle in the transference. Um, and I would say as it relates to institutional transference, I would say that I guess the positive dimension of the, the, the institutional transfer, tra transference is at, if there's a real struggle with the images, because if there's a real struggle with the images, like again, having a father or a mother complex with someone in an institution, if you really struggle through that process, you might be able to bring to consciousness what's really going on and there might be a possibility for a cure. But um, if there's just this sort of unconscious possession, then I think it would be this mental bondage. The point here, as it relates to the analytic struggle of transference is that all of the forces which have caused the libido to regress will rise up and defend themselves as resistances, namely that they don't want to be um, cured. Uh, they don't want to be overcome. Uh, they want to remain in regression. They want to remain hidden um, because, again, they, they don't see the value in um, becoming conscious and directing themselves towards reality. There's, again, this attraction towards reality, which has diminished. Um, and the reason why the attraction towards reality has diminished is because of, and this is the core point of the next paper, which is the frustration of satisfaction. Namely, that the more an individual feels frustrated in their sexuality, the more this unconscious introversion will occur. Um, the unconscious introversion is basically a reaction against maybe what we covered in previous lectures um, about the reality principle um, and about the frustration the subject feels uh, as it attempts to adapt uh, basically to the world and to still maintain um, a semblance of libidinal enjoyment. So basically the attraction of the unconscious has to be overcome um, and the repression of the unconscious instincts and its products must be removed. And you could imagine that this is where you're going to get the very dark 
and the very um, possibly violent or emotional hostile um, reactions from the patient. You know, and I like this image here of, of, of Golem and even the character of Schmeagle turning into Golem because Schmeagle turning into Golem with the Ring of Power, like that's a good example. That's a good image of how the unconscious introversion occurs and how someone leaves reality. They leave reality and they guard their precious unconscious image. Um, so I think that's a good image there of like what's really going on here when someone becomes frustrated with reality. Um, and oftentimes it is about libido and power. You know, it's about the, the, that I don't have any power in my libidinal desire. Uh, and that's where the frustration lies. So there's a struggle between two forces. Again, you hear you see here Freud's emphasis on tension, metaphysically Freud's emphasis on dualism that there's forces striving to recovery and there's forces turning away from reality. So if any of you know people in your life who have become very introverted into themselves, um, whether that's through video games, whether that's through basically um, turning away from the world and hiding in their room, there are forces that want to recover and there are forces which are going to try to continue guarding their turn away from reality. Um, and that's the pathogenic complex, which Freud says is guarded with the great obstinacy uh, uh, upon when, when it's brought to analytic closeness. That, that being, when you point out to them, you know, say with, uh, with Golem, you know, you're holding really tightly onto that ring of power there in your cave. Um, as soon as it's brought to closeness analytically, it is guarded with great obstinacy. So there is always this readiness of the libido to remain in possession of the infantile imagos. That is the ring of power. The ring of power is the infantile imagos. They're guarding their image of the mother. They're guarding the image of the father. They're guarding the image of the brother or the sister. Um, and treatment can only be achieved if we enter into the relations of resistance, the resistance to, to being cured, that's the analytic struggle. So the patient, then here's the transference, is that the patient will make the object of emotional impulse coincide with the doctor. That's why the analyst has to go through their own process of analysis before they can become an analysis, because otherwise they're not going to be able to navigate these processes of transference, which can both be positive and affectionate. So, you know, you could, you could in some sense manipulate or take advantage of that. The person is being extremely affectionate towards you, or the person is being extremely negative, extremely hostile with you. Um, so that's where the, the violence and the, the, the pain can, can emerge. Um, and these impulses, and this is, I think, such an important point. These impulses want to re be reproduced in a timeless hallucination. So like an eternal he he hallucination. Um, again, the unconscious knows no time. The unconscious is in some sense outside of time, outside of the logic of linear time. Um, and they're just timeless hallucinations. So to give a concrete example, um, someone who has developed a transference of an affectionate or a, a hostile kind is basically reproducing their stereotype plate onto the analyst as if they were still children as if they were back in the actual painful state when they were three or four years old. Um, and that's going to be reproduced in no matter how old they are. They could be 20, they could be 40, they could be 60. Um, the point is that the unconscious impulses do not take account of the real situation. They have no capacity to see the real situation. Um, and this is very um, concrete, practical for our day-to-day um, -day lives. Um, there are oftentimes conflicts that emerge which are um, unable to be resolved simply because there's unconscious images which are unable to see the real situation. 
um, and, and, and they provoke a lot of emotional turmoil as a result. So the point of the analysis is to compel the emotional impulses to the real life history of the situation um, and submit the emotional impulses to intellectual consideration and to understand their deeper psychological value. So in other words, um, these emotional impulses um, shouldn't be numbed and repressed. They should be brought to consciousness and they should be made in service of reality. Um, they have a psychological value. Um, it's just that they have uh, need to go through a deeper maturation. They need to go through a deeper development to uh, basically um, meet the present moment, let's say, to meet the present moment with maturity, let's say. So this is the, the final slide of this paper, is that the struggle here between the doctor and the patient uh, in a transference process is a struggle between intellect and instinct, uh, a struggle between understanding and seeking to act out. Um, so basically the subject isn't capable to become as intellectual, isn't capable of becoming as understanding as they could possibly be because their instincts and their desire to act out their infantile impulses um, are uh, controlling them, um, dominating them. They're under unconscious domination. And that's the field of transference where Freud says victory must be won. Now, I have some experience with this in my life where I can definitely corroborate that, that controlling transference is the greatest difficulty um, because the patient's hidden and forgotten erotic impulses have become immediate and manifest. E exactly. It's that imagine a two-year-old or a three-year-old throwing a tantrum because it's not getting its own way. Now, imagine the transference is that that 20 year old or that 40 year old or that 60 year old is acting like a t is throwing a childish childish tantrum is throwing a, basically a tantrum as if it were still two, as if he or she were still two. Um, but uh, Freud also claims that working through this tantrum, working through this a process of transference has to happen because you can't destroy these unconscious impulses either in absence or in representation. Namely, that you actually have to work through these images with an other person, a, a real physical person. Um, and maybe that's the whole problem of the modern mental health crisis, to be honest with you. Like just to give some sort of maybe like added speculation here that when we think about the modern mental health crisis and we think about the way in which our con contemporary institutions are trying to solve mental problems, namely by numbing our emotions, namely by trying to treat our deep emotional complexes as if they're like a fast food, you know, here, take these pills and you'll be cured. That's not how it works. And the problem is, is that it's so much struggle to actually bring another person to psychological maturity. It takes so much interpersonal work to bring another person to psychological maturity that it's easier to just not do it. It's easy. It's easier to not put the, the emotional investment um, into helping another person work through their childish impulses. Um, so I, I really think that at the core of the mental health crisis is how do we affirm and engage in this struggle with the other and their, 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 their deep unconscious, unconscious images. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of people that are simply lost to history, basically. So that, that leads us into the second paper, Types of Onset of Neurosis. And in this paper, what I want to say is it's shorter uh, and I can summarize it more quickly, namely that of all these different onsets of neurosis, we're going to see that the common element 
um, between them is, again, this frustration of satisfaction. What's really at the core of psychoanalysis, it seems, is the libido's frustration with actualization. And at the same time, the need to actualize the libido to develop our highest potential. So there's really this, this struggle. This is the line, let's say, that, that psychoanalysis is walking. So Freud starts off by claiming that the vicissitudes of the libido will decide in favor of nervous health or sickness. Namely that if the libido is capable of being brought to consciousness and being brought into service of reality, um, that we are going to have a higher likelihood of psychological health. If it's not, then we're going to have a higher likelihood of sickness. So for that reason, neurosis is traceable to the development of the innate varieties of libidinal expression, plus the influences of the external world. As I sort of said in the, the first paper, here connecting the two papers, Freud is saying that both you know, to put it in maybe common terms, both nature and nurture are at work. Um, there's a complex interaction between the two, which will determine the um, modes of love and the modes of the expression of libido um, from the subject. And here, the, the central point is that the most obvious cause of the neurosis is frustration in love um, and the need for a real object to satisfy love. Um, so basically here we're dealing in Lacanian terms with the lost object. We're dealing with the impossibility of the lost object um, that maybe extends the metaphysical speculation out um, into the full sort of totality of the problem. Uh, the frustration of the lost object. So the, again, most obvious cause, frustration in love. Uh, this is the libidinal vicissitudes. The subject becomes neurotic when the object is withdrawn without an adequate substitute. So um, for example, those who have mother and father issues, um, you might uh, uh, feel as though the mother is lacking or the father is lacking or lost or not giving you enough attention, that withdrawn object um, becomes the source of neurosis, which potentially gets an outlet in intimate connection later in life, where you'll then play out and dramatize this neurosis um, with a love partner. Um, it might for a moment allow for a libidinal um, uh, 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 expression um, but ultimately, when that partner fails, when that partner leaves, when that partner is withdrawn, the whole drama will continue. The whole, the whole problem will reemerge. Now, Freud does suggest that fate can offer a better cure than a physician, for example, by offering the patient a substitute satisfaction for loss. But again, in Lacanian terms, in, in probably deeper metaphysical speculation, um, the, 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 the substitute satisfactions for the loss are never total. They can always be lost. Um, they can be re-lost um, and they can be, be um, again, the, the, the loss seems more fundamental um, than, than the possibilities. For, like there, any substitute satisfaction will eventually fail in the end. But nonetheless, we have to navigate this loss. We have to bring the subject to the level of this loss. So the frustration here, again, the libidinal frustration, um, Freud uses the metaphor of a dam. It dams up the libido. There you have an image of a river being dammed, can't get by the wall. So again, you have this and this terminology actually is very useful and, and, and appears, I think, in the modern sexual landscape um, as it relates to like, for example, um, some red pill guys saying women hit the wall or um, 
or how incels will complain about um, being involuntary celibates, namely that they're being damned up. So they're using this metaphor of the damning of the libido themselves um, in the real of the sexual marketplace in contemporary terms. Um, so the subject basically has to submit to a test for how long he or she can tolerate the increase of the psychological tension and plus the methods they develop to deal with this damning up. Now, I think here we reached the level where sexuality and sublimation becomes the foundation for many spiritual or artistic outlets, many spiritual or artistic vocations. Um, for me, I think it was athletics and academics. Um, I first tried to unleash my libido in the athletic field. Um, I then tried to unleash my libido in the academic field. So um, it's just this dealing with methods for how to sublimate the psychological tension. Um, so the first possibility he says there is to transform the psychological tension into an active energy in the external world. If that fails, then you'll find the subject in analysis. Like for example, myself, <laughs> or you can also renounce libidinal satisfaction. Uh, this renunciation and this movement of renunciation is the foundation for many traditions like, for example, uh, the, the monk or the nun who withdraw from the whole libidinal tension. Now, for, uh, Freud says that the libido becoming introverted, um, turning away from reality, is a danger because the life of fantasy can dominate over reality testing. And I think everything here in Lacanian traversing of the fantasy can be found in sort of a synthesis between these two dimensions where there might actually be something gained uh, for subjectivity in becoming dominated by the life of fantasy if they can then take this fantasy and bring it into a deeper relationship with reality testing. Ultimately, if we can bring fantasy into relationship with reality testing, we can become deeper, uh, more mature subjects, let's say. So I here have this image of the incel and the, the chad, which are these images uh, of the, the, the involuntary celibate and the, the stereotypical guy who doesn't have problems with women. Um, and I use this as the second cause of the frustration, namely the internal effort to obtain satisfaction uh, also can cause frustration um, because basically there's insurmountable internal obstacles. So uh, this would be the example of incels who claim that we have insurmountable internal obstacles, namely that we are constitutionally, genetically, uh, incapable of attaining our love object. We don't have the genetic constitution. We do not have the developmental uh, capacity to, um, to actualize our sexuality. They become inflexible. They become unable. Um, and again, this frustration goes back to the common factor of damming up the libido, which leads to the infantile regression over the forward development. So people stop developing. Now, for the incel specifically, the best example I've heard articulated is you just have to get better with your method of sublimation. That you have to get better at your methods of sublimation and you have to um, con con continue to develop in whatever way you want. Um, but there has to be a way you pull yourself away from the infantile regression, which is so, so common um, today. Now, this is the final, final slide of this uh, presentation, um, quickly covering the third and fourth cause of neuroses, which can be linked with both puberty and menopause. So with puberty, you have basically an increase of libido. 
when you have an increase of libido, there's the possibility of neurosis because you don't know what to do with that increase. Um, I remember again, when I was 13 or 14 and I, I started to masturbate, I recall immediately being shocked at how much this increase of libido was going to disrupt my psyche. Um, so that can cause a neurosis. Um, and then with, with, with uh, menopause, as an example, um, you can also have a, a, a damming up of, of, of the libido, um, basically related to growing older. Um, and, uh, and this is, this is another struggle, which I, I haven't put as much thought into namely because I, I'm not a woman and I haven't experienced it, but, um, it would be interesting to talk about that process in the, uh, discussion. Um, the overall point I want to leave you with here, and I'm going to stop the presentation in, in a moment is that the primary factor and what we're dealing with here is the damming up of libido and the frustration that that causes, ultimately leading to neurotic illness. Um, and what we're working with here is frustrated subjectivity. In Buddhist terms, you have the idea that life is suffering. In psychoanalytic terms, you have this idea that the subject is frustrated in their, in their sexuality. And, and we're trying to work through this ultimately not towards a withdrawal from reality, but towards a um, confrontation with reality testing that where all of the unconscious impulses have been brought to consciousness or a lot of them, and they've been put in service of reality testing. So it's really, I think, a radical knowledge um, it's a radical um, process that we're going through. Um, and the end goal is not, again, the withdrawal from reality, but a new, a new form of subjectivity capable of investigating reality in a way that maybe only few subjects have been able to in history. So I think it's a really courageous, it's courageous to submit to analysis. Um, it's courageous to go through that process. Um, so I'll, I'll end there. So I think, yeah, again, just the, the, for the, for the, for the, for the first, for the first, for the first paper, I would like, like the, where the, the major thoughts I'm left with is, how do we inscribe into our institutions and the mental health problem, the vicissitudes of transference, the emotional complexes, how they get attached onto the other and that we need to work through them. You can't avoid it. And then on the other hand, in the other paper, this frustration of libidinal satisfaction as the cause of the neuroses. I think they go together nicely, these papers. Very nice. I'll uh, get the ball rolling on that. Um, by sh sharing some of my insights as I was reading, reading through this, and I was constantly being drawn back to Lacan's uh, Seminar 11. Um, to begin with, uh, I, I just noticed in this footnote um, at the very beginning of this paper, where he he talks about the uh, the these, these two Greek words, uh, vemon and tihi, and uh, tihi meaning chance, um, and it's something that that Lacan actually devotes an entire chapter to in Seminar Eleven, an entire session, and the the the, the whole. Uh, point of this is that the the chance encounter which is that initial encounter with the other the mother that that uh, mother imago as he talks about is what sets in motion the uh, the um automaton that constant cyclical automatic uh process that drives the uh, these libidinal attachments that 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 are 
uh, present in the uh, transference. Um, and, and so understanding the automaton here that is set in motion by chance, by the, that initial encounter is I think very important. And it, and it goes back to a, a lot of Lacan's thought is centered around the, the notion of, of all of these concepts as being functions. So again, I'm, I'm kind of drawing upon my experience as a, as a um, computer scientist is, is the, the notion of the function in the, in the mathematical sense. You have an input that's mapped to an output and that function as an automaton is always present in the unconscious. And the inputs of reality are constantly then being taken into that function and it's producing an output, a symptom, which is in, in certain situations is a transferential uh, process. And it, in, uh, the se in the 10th um, session of seminar 11, which is just fascinating, um, and you have to read it maybe a couple of times to really get what Lacan says, but what he says is absolutely um, uh, groundbreaking and, and, and completely shocking, really, is in that he says, and, I, and this is going back to what Freud says in this paper of the, the imagos, is that the presence of the analyst is within the subject latent within the subject and within the unconscious. And it, it is as if the, the subject, the, the analyst end, brings the analyst out and constitutes the presence of the, of the analyst in, in, in the analytic setting. And what he's saying is, and he goes on to say this explicitly, is that the, the, the notion of the big other is latent within the subject. And it is constantly looking for in these pulsations of the opening of the unconscious, that big other that is latent within the, in, within the subject, we could call that the, the uh, father imago, the mother imago, whatever, is constantly looking for an out to come out in the opening of the unconscious. Yeah. And, and so in the analytic setting, it, it comes, there's this opening of the unconscious and it comes out and it transfers onto the analyst. And then there's a closing back up. And so what is being transferred, and again, this is an automaton, it's, a, it's an automatic opening and closing of the unconscious. What is being transferred is not affect, it's not love or hate, it is, this function of the big other that is being transferred onto the analyst, the professor, the priest, the pastor, the whatever. It's all kind of the same thing. And it doesn't matter who it is. There is always this automaton that's trying to break out of the unconscious and attach itself and to constitute a big other. And then from that point, the, the paradox of transference as this resistance that is also necessary for the analytic cure, if there is one, is that by constituting the big other in the transferential process, there is then a window back into the unconscious because this big other is the, the the unconscious is the discourse of the big other and so that is what creates this kind of hook back into the unconscious uh and and i think we can see that that those ideas are present in freud in this paper uh, and lacan does a, a wonderful job of bringing those out um, so I, I, I definitely highly recommend um, people read Seminar 11 um, in that uh, uh, session, I think it's session four and session 10, where he brings out this notion of the automaton and then later in the, the, the presence of the analyst, the big other that is within the subject. So I'll, I'll stop there and let people comment. 
That was brilliant. Did anyone, any, anyone have a, have a, have a commentary on, on, on that? Mr. Ford? <laughs> just, just notice, I notice, I notice, and I'm just trying to relate that back to, to myself. Cause for me, I, 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 what I, what I took away from this, these papers is really the desire to broaden analytic theory outside of the analytic session and to see the way in which the field of analysis is happening everywhere, um, especially in our in institutions um, and in our, obviously our, in our intimate relationships. Um, but I see, for example, in every project I try to start, in every collaboration or project that I'm, I'm involved in, there's this problem of the big other and the opening and closing and this waiting, this image in the subject, either in myself or another person of the desire to, to the desire for the big other to be present. And, and the, and this, this opening of the unconscious, which happens just automatically um, and, and, and this, th these games of projection, which get played out and the, and how do we deal with this? Because it, it's, it's, it's such a trip because on the one hand, on the level of conscious ego, it's like, I'm a mature adult. We're having irrational discussions. <laughs> and then underneath, almost like a subtext, it, it is like a subtext of the mature rational discourse. There are all of these weird infantile games playing themselves out, which are related to, I don't know, desire for security, desire for attention, desire for, it's like we, there's all of this, which, which, which makes or breaks the project. It's almost like if I can, we have to become aware that when we're relating to each other and when we're engaged with each other in so-called civilized work, there, that we're really carrying not just the present moment of what we're seeing in the other person, but we're also carrying their infantile self. And, 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 they're, and they can interact, those, those layers of the self can be can be interacting with us simultaneously. That's one thing that Lacan says is that the desire to love is the desire to be loved, and and that is what um, is actually constituting the resistance in the sac in the in the analytic session is that in loving in, in this transferential love of the analyst uh, the the analyst end is is actually trying to get the analyst to love them. And in doing so, it, it, it is resistance to the conflictual nature of the, of the analytic discourse. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, feel free to, feel free to join in, Stanley. Okay, okay. Um, I've been you know, a hospital administrator, all sorts of things. It's very, very difficult to get people to relate to unconscious factors in interactions because it arouses tremendous anxiety. Um, I once, I remember a long time ago, I was treating very successfully a child and I was speaking with a mother afterwards and she says something about her mother uh, who had been quite disturbed and I said, well, you know, your mother had issues, at which point she became instantly furious, said, my mother was a perfect mother, walked out, I never saw the child again. Okay, so it arouses tremendous anxiety to relate what's going on in the adult to what happened in earlier life, you know, particularly child experiences. Maybe the best way to do this is to sort of, um, you know, uh, speak with a person on a one-to-one -one basis in terms of, you know, their feelings about things. Um, I remember another instance in which um, 
I did psychological testing, uh, another job uh, in which I was a, a county chief psychologist, a psychological testing on a child. And I gave my point of view, you know, at the case conference, I presented my findings and um, a nurse there who, um, you know, an older nurse who we've been very friendly. And she said, well, uh, did you consider that the child might have a hearing problem? Now, it's a bit like saying, my God, you know, you're a real idiot. <laughs> you know, <laughs> how could you not consider this, <laughs> you know? And, but again, I didn't say anything to her in the conference. I just went to her, over to her afterwards. And I said, I, I said to the director, I said, you know, she really hurt my feelings when she said this, because, you know, obviously, I've been doing this a long time. I know what I'm doing. And so the director spoke with her and she apologized to me afterwards. And, everything is okay but um it's, it's very difficult to to raise up unconscious kinds of things um whether it's in you know a, a group setting or in terms of you have a, a husband who you know in which the wife is relating in a particular way or vice versa and to uh, you know get the the spouse to relate to the, hey, you know, you're not really relating to me, you're really relating to, you know, how your father related to you back when, you know, you're really yeah, very angry yeah. at the father. And so it's coming out now, you know, it yeah, is yeah. very difficult, very it, difficult. And you get people even in the mental health profession where, you know, the uh, one case spouse uh, might be a social worker or something. And they just simply, they just keep repeating it over and over again the same kinds of things that they did all their life. You know, they, in fact, I can't think why I read, read something like that these trauma that it has, you know, when you have severe trauma, it has almost like a neurological impulse, well, a neurological basis where you, ca you cannot relate to it logically. It sort of short circuits the ability to relate logically to the particular trauma that caused it. And so, um, you know, it's rough. <laughs> it is it is that yeah, yeah another that, yeah go ahead mika yeah i find that the really uh, crucial point there and but i think that there might be a kind of temptation here to try and search for some type of like beyond of the speech of the subject and if you read somebody like lacan's um first se first seminar in there you find him really stressing that it's not the beyond of the speech that we are looking for. I mean, in psychology, perhaps the sort of what he says, some some kind of like cramps or gestures and emotions of the subject that might uh, be the object of the uh, like the person of care. But in what is at stake in analysis is uh, what type of speech is really uh, Freudian uh, analysis. What 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 is it really to speak in an analysis? So I think that these two papers really are seminal in this sense, since they deal with transference and uh, resistance, and they are deeply connected. And one can also point out that the difference between Freud and somebody who would be working with, say, hypnotic methods of drugs and uh, all kinds of things that they try to employ to sort of like uh, make the patient more relaxed and so on to approach the material. What Freud is working with is material that has uh, resistance inherent to it. You cannot really get to the kind of like uh, nucleus of the, the verbal, verbal nucleus of uh, the neurosis without encountering resistance. This is one of the key points that Lacan points out in it, in the very early like seminar. And what is the type of like resistance here? It's an open question also, but also we need to think, keep in mind what is it really to speak in analysis. It is for Lacan some type of like approaching the cracks or the hollows of the subject's uh, capa capa capability of integrating or uh, synthesizing the history, it's going to, the resistance is going to be more, be more pronounced when you are approaching the sort of verbal nucleus of the neurosis. And he says that this is, per, this is the, exactly the uh, 
fertile moment in the analysis. The moment of intervention of the analyst is really crucial and it is not conceptualized in many, many practices of analysis as well. Yeah, sorry. No, it's another, that's another um, really good point. I just wanted to say that what it's evoking for me, both um, what you said, Stanley, and what you said, Mika, is basically a self-referential sort of notion that in order to really be an analyst, you have to be extremely comfortable with tension and struggle in speech. Like you have to, and you have to be disidentified, totally disidentified with the speech of the subject of the, of the patient or the, or if you're, or if you're outside of analysis, if you're in an institutional setting, if you have a type of enlightened detachment, you are capable of navigating the tensions of the speech potentially. But if you don't have that capacity, the problem is, is that you're going to be pulled into the games of the resistance and it's, and it's not going to help the person. You're just going to be, you're, you're, you're just going to be taking too seriously the, 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 the speech of the subject and not seeing it as their unconscious processing, if that makes sense. Counter transference. Um, yeah, yeah, under transference, but um, J uh, Jayati counter transference. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. These games of transference and counter transference will just be will, will just be delaying the cure of the the, the person. Um, Jayati, yeah. you had your hand up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, so uh, I just want to add one thread over here where I became a little uh, uncomfortable. Um, I have I myself when I experience transference and it's also coming from my own experience. I think it's important to read this particular article with what we discussed last time or the maybe before that when we were also looking at reverse transference. Because uh, the entire tone of this article where we are so worried about the language of ana analysts and analysis and all of it, rightfully so. But I'm, but uh, um, I, somewhere, uh, somewhere there is this hierarchy that is constantly being played out. Where we, are, where we are also forgetting that there can be a scope of a reverse transference also, which might be playing a role in transference as well. Absolutely. I just wanted to wanted to say that I, maybe I didn't I didn't point it out well enough, um, or I didn't make a comment. It's certainly not uh, explicit in the in the paper by Freud. But when we have a transference which is affectionate, or we have a transference which is hostile, um, there is this hierarchy. Uh, whether it's in an institutional setting or whether, whether it's in an analytic context, where these games of transference can be uh, manipulated and exploited by the hierarchy. Like I've seen many, like how many times have we seen, for example, um, or at least I'll speak for myself, how many times have I seen a grad student or something uh, falling in love with their professor and the professor simply allowing that to happen thinking it is sort of like a you know like it like a val like a valid uh sort of th uh, thing instead of sort of seeing it as this transference neurosis which is being played out and the hierarchical power of the professor sort of giving them sort of a a a a, a, a I, don't, I don't know a, a, any god a demigod yeah ex exactly yeah like they're, they're like a kind of type of demigod which is reflected in the fact that that professor probably hasn't worked through their own unconscious complexes if they're going to exploit that in the in the student i i agree with you and i also over there agree with your last observation of uh, mental health institutions and academic institutions also uh, i am uh -huh. in india and in India, you know, we celebrate most of the academic institutions as big family, which which is a bit problematic. But it's a it's a celebratory tone that uh, your university is like a big family, which then also means that you celebrate the demigods. And uh, of course, then the transference is not something which is one is supposed to be reflexive about it. It's something that you know one continues to submit and. Uh, 
another academic hierarchy that continues. So I, I agree with you on that, yeah. I have a question though, regarding um, the, in psychoanalysis, Freud chose to not sit like uh, in front of the patient. So they cannot look at each other, but the patient is on the bench laying and Freud is like sitting behind it, writing no notes and stuff like that. And I think this is also very interesting in the question of transference, like um, the role of the face that like, is it for Freud? Was it for Freud and the psychoanalyst or was it for the analysant that they couldn't look at each other? Because to me, it kind of seems like if I was going to be a psychoanalyst, I wouldn't want to look at the face of the patient because then I can have transference for him or her. I feel like. Yeah. If any, if anyone else wants to field that question, that's cool. I, I, I would, I would just say, yeah, it, it, it's, it's probably something that Freud put into. I, 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 I noticed that that process of of having a, a detached analytic process where you're not staring at each other in the face is something that Freud put into place after his sort of initial collaborations with Brewer um, and sort of the movement away from hypnosis. Um, and probably because precisely for the reason that he was getting involved in the resistances of transference and counter-transference. So to, to reduce that as much as possible. Um, yeah, it's in some sense like a very, it, it makes the analysis a, a, a necessary coldness to it. Um, there, there's a coldness to it, which, which, is, which is necessary. Um, um, and, and, it's, and the coldness is like kind of like this, again, this, the analyst has this ethical responsibility to be kind of detached and, and unidentified with the emotional tensions which are going on in the, in the patient and at the same time have the sort of clarity of observation to make the right intervention, to make the right cut. No, I think that's great. And, and I think it, that's why I emphasize it in my earlier comments, the, the notion of the automaton is that this, this transferential um, function is, is all automatic and it, it's going to happen in almost any relationship that is um, uneven. There's a hierarchy involved. Um, I've noticed it in, you know, as a teacher um, in the past where, you know, I've, you know, just be, I have a certain fondness for my students and uh, a certain care and concern that, you know, may be exaggerated. And, um, and I think we all have to be aware, you know, whatever position we we're in, either in a, uh, as a supervisor or a boss or um, a clergyman or, or whatever that, or, you know, in a, in a, um, you know, being in a position over other people, that the counter-transference is just as present and powerful. Or if you're in a subservient role as a student or, um, you know, or a worker or whatever, that, that there can be um, the, the transference there can, can also be, and, and it's, it's, it's just this automatic thing that's going to happen. And the more that we can be aware of it in our social interactions, um, then we can, we can take preventative measures that will hopefully ensure that our interactions, our social interactions and relationships are as authentic as possible. You know, and, and I, 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 I thought about the, you know, this image that we have of the, the Catholic confessional, you know, where the, the priest and the um, the penitent are, you know, in this kind of box and there's a screen that's, that's separating them. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we think about that as being for, you know, so that the penitent will, will not have this uh, embarrassment. But I think it's also, we could think about it, it, it's there just as much for the priest as it is for the penitent in that it prevents the priest from having any kind of bias 
that could be generated from a, 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 a counter transference. And so we can imagine this situation and you know, the, 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 the arrangement of Freud's couch and, and his chair as being very similar in, in that regard to the, to the confessional. So you have to erect this kind of barrier uh, you know, within that relationship in order to, to have any kind of authentic uh, discourse. Shouldn't one distinguish between um, what's magical in treatment? And can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we hear you. Yes. Oh, okay, it's just good. Okay. No, I'm thinking that I think, um, again, I'm more concerned. I think psychoanalysis, as my uh, graduate school advisor said, you know, when you try and understand human behavior, you have to go back to psychoanalytic thinking. There's no place else to go, which I think is true. But I've always thought it's true. But um, I think in terms of treatment, uh, one has to distinguish between, um, let's say, the magical artifacts and what is really important. And, um, you know, whether a person lies on the, in terms of treatment, uh, you know, whether a person lies on the couch or sits facing the person really isn't important. Uh, you know, and I can understand in terms of, well, one might be freer in terms of speaking, you know, about uncomfortable kinds of things if you're not seeing the person you're speaking to. But, you know, if you really trust someone, uh, you're, you know, the patient is going to speak about really very, very open kinds of things. And it's not a matter of whether you're facing the person or not facing the person. Uh, if anything, I think that, you know, one must be, the more real a person you are as a clinician, the greater progress the person can make, the patient can make, which is not, however, to say that you don't have to keep detached. Um, you know, and again, what you're speaking about in terms of the uh, gentleman spoke in terms of the teacher who might get involved with the student and stuff like that. Yeah, okay, but there are moral kinds of things in terms of, uh, you know, you do not, it's just simply not done. It's not permissible to do that. It's not permissible to touch a patient. You know, things like that, that that protects both the patient and also protects the doctor too. Uh, but I think it's important to distinguish in terms of treatment between the artifacts, the, if you will, the archaic artifacts historic artifacts and what is really real in terms of the notion of the unconscious, the power of the unconscious. Uh, someone once said to me, um, Sky Trist, who worked the CIA actually, and I've stolen his phrase many times over, <laughs> you know, he said that uh, the unconscious is very powerful and one must respect his power, which I think is true and I think is a vastly ignored statement uh, publicly. That's it, my rant. <laughs> it's a good rant, yeah. It's a good rant and I, I, I agree that it might not be too essential if the patient faces the analyst or not. I mean, I mean I'm not an analyst and I, I don't know the exact like mechanisms of the situation, but uh, it didn't throw it like start his whole couch thing because he wanted to diminish the stress, the physical stress that the analytical situation itself brings about. It might be that it's working more for the analyst if the situation is like that, but really it's up to whoever is doing it. And I was thinking that maybe some type of objection to uh, having a kind of normal face-to-face -face conversation in the Leo of an psychoanalytic setting would be that maybe if the analyst and the analysand are constant in a constant face-to-face -face, uh, relation, it might be that the analysand, if, if he or she is uh, really hysteric, might start and try and adopt the ego of the analyst instead of pursuing uh, the hollows or the fertile moments of truth in analysis. So I think that it's it might be tempting for the person of uh, cure or therapeutic uh, uh, 
authority to start administering morality instead of a Freudian analysis. And it's really a pitfall that I think many uh, would fall in the deviationism that Lacan is uh, bashing against. I don't know about, again, I don't know anything about Lacan's work, but I think that there are four, four elements of psychotherapy of which, um, you know, you have a supportive element in which you support present defenses and functioning. The relationship in which you concentrate on the relationship between the patient and the doctor. Uh, the analytic in which you relate present experiences to early developmental experiences, but they, I think is extremely important because it enables a person to make sense of their life. You know, if they say, okay, I'm doing this very puzzling kind of thing because of what happened very early in childhood, then suddenly the life makes sense. And finally, the replacement in which you want to replace the deficient psycho, uh, you know, ego capacities uh, that develop in the first three years of life with more mature ones. So there's a number of elements of psychotherapy. The analytic is really just one. Um, but again, uh, uh, on a, the basis, the underneath it is, of course, the patient identifying with the therapist, if you will. Uh, and, you know, this enables all these four to function. I mean, there are friendly aspects in therapy, but it's not a friendship. And that, you know, one is always very aware that, you know, when, when a doctor says something, they say it for purpose, they don't just say it. You know, even if they talk about, you know, the movie that the patient saw, there's a reason why they're doing it, okay? It's not just talk, you know? There is this gulf, there has to be this gulf. It protects both of them. Another rant. <laughs> no, it's very, very, yeah. very helpful. I, I just I just want to I, I maybe want to ask a, a naive question to to everyone, um, which I know Lacan makes some some statement about, but it's it's basically what is really the difference between the psychoanalytic process and like the Catholic confessional? Is it that in the Catholic confessional you aren't really working through the transference and counter transference? Like what, are you just getting morality or, or like, what do you think is the difference going on there? Cause it's like the same type of thing where there are two, there's like a hierarchical relationship between a priest or in this case, a psychoanalyst, an analyst. Um, and, and there is this sort of same structure where you're not looking at each other face to face. So it's not a normal sort of interaction between friends. But it's apparent. I mean, again, if you want to think of the, uh, you know, in terms of the, you know, what's closest to an individual, if you will, may be the religion they're born into. And so here, if you have a, you know, a penitent speaking to a priest, it's almost like to their father. And if the father absolves them of guilt and says, you know, whatever, again, I don't know how it goes. But, um, you know, then they feel better, you know. It may, it may actually, you know, some people can change powerfully through religion. It may enable them to sort of comfort themselves to, no, not comfort themselves, there's another term, um, to feel less guilty about things, to um, uh, give up on things that they should have given up on long ago and to start anew. I mean, religion, religion can be a powerful force. Yeah, but again, yeah, but the my... most obvious difference be that in the Catholic uh, situation, the uh, person is not uh, reinstating or uh, reforming his or her history. It's a different purpose. I mean, it's obvious. Yes, yes. It's an acceptance. And the priest is accepting you. I accept you as you are, and I forgive you. And you can go out anew. So yeah, in a sense, yeah. there are similarities, I guess, in terms of how one relates to a priest and how one relates to a doctor. I mean, again, you know, trying, you know, when you, let's say a person's awaiting the results of a medical test and they feel very depressed and very anxious and all sorts of things. And then suddenly the doctor says, oh, it's nothing, it's fine. 
everything is transformed. They're totally different. And there are elements of that, I would think, in terms of how a priest functions too. And they have their own magical kinds of things in terms of the booth, in terms of the church, in terms of the music, in terms of the incense. So, you know, we're on some level, we're all pretty primitive. <laughs> I, I think there's, um, I think there's a, a very complex dialectic that, that happens in confession. And uh, the confessional is highly contingent upon the relationship between the subject and the and the priest uh, my it, my experience of it uh, personally has been within the eastern orthodox uh, setting where there there is no confessional box there is no separation there's a much more intimate connection between the priest and the and the penitent and that relationship is actually even often called um, the, the the person will call their their confessor their spiritual father and uh, that relationship can often be um, an ongoing relationship that is that is built up over time. Uh, a person will will have someone. It may not be their parish priest, but they'll call them their spiritual father. It may be a monk, an abbot, or something that they'll specifically travel and go to for confession. Um, and and so that can that can develop in positive ways or that can develop in very negative ways. And the, you know, the, the confession experience can, it can be liberating, that's, that's its, its intention, but it can also reinforce neuroses. And, and I think that's, that's what um, I think is the difference between uh, psychoanalysis and confession is that Within analysis, there is a, 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 a specific approach to getting behind the act, behind the, the sin itself, the symptom, okay, and getting into the, the, the unconscious. And that is what I think confession, either the Catholic or, or the Orthodox uh, forms of it, is, is simply unable to do. And in, in, in specifically in getting to the unconscious and actually going through an analytic practice. Confession is not analytic at all. In, in many ways, it's more synthetic. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's tries to offer uh, a synthetic solution. Oh, your, your symptom is caused by pride or lust or gluttony or whatever. And it doesn't really get to looking at unconscious um, uh, causes of, of neurosis. Is it? I, I wonder if it is that because, again, I, I haven't, uh, I'm only, uh, um, yeah, actually, pastoral counseling is, is heavily, has been heavily tied into psychoanalysis, uh, psychoanalytic thinking since the 1920s. Uh, and of course, you know, they're individual practitioners, but, um, Again, I don't know how they actually work, but uh, it, it may be in terms of the, uh, I'm thinking of one person in particular, where you know, he had acted very, very badly throughout his life. And he certainly felt better talking to his priest regularly about it, you know, in addition to therapy. But it gave him something going to church regularly. So you know, I certainly wouldn't discount it, uh, even if it isn't. Um, giving him greater understanding of perhaps the, the roots of, but again, you know, people can change. I, I don't know that insight, miss, insight doesn't necessarily lead to change, personal change. You know, you can have great insight. Well, what, what I think- No change. What, what, I think can, what I think can happen there is, is that the going to confession and the right. whole process of getting absolution can become symptomatic itself. In other words, it becomes mm -hmm. a, a way that the subject symptomatically copes with their with the damming up of the libido the 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 uh you know the the, the neurotic symptom and, and so instead of being something that's trying to untangle the the knots of neurosis um the process of, of confession and getting absolution really becomes more of a kind of masturbatory um 
symptom that the subject uses in order to uh, not not only get the kind of satisfaction uh, this the you know this freedom from from the guilt that's associated with their neuroses of their their sin, but it actually then constitutes that it's the the, the sin itself, and I think it's, that's what the anal analytic theory, uh, especially Lacanian theory, would would um, would would say. I just if thanks, it, Eric. It I, Stan, Stanley. I just yeah. I just want to get to. Sure. There's a few questions, so I, oh, I want sure. to get to sure. to Rhea and then Alexandra. So Rhea, if you want to unmute yourself. Okay, so mine's not really a question. It's more just I. Um, yeah, it's both uh, what Eric and Stanley have said, um, but. Eric was talking mostly about Catholic and Orthodox confession, and Stanley has brought up um, pastoral counseling. And they're both very different, right? But what I agree with both of you, what Eric has said about confession um, is definitely true. That's the most like glaring difference uh, between Catholic or Orthodox confession and psychoanalysis is that priests or whoever's um, behind the confession box is obliged to give you some sort of solution, even if it's not addressing um, the actual problem. There are almost predetermined solutions to give people um, for what they've confessed to you. So you're meant to be leaving with some um, perhaps short-term solution. Like if you do this, um, you are sort of forgiven or well it's like an actual forgiveness like the the priest is meant to be a vehicle of the forgiveness that's given to you by god um but at no point do you leave the booth not forgiven and at no point do you leave the booth um with any kind of admonition from uh the priest you are meant to be left with something that makes you feel better but then in the Christian church or um, in pastoral counseling, it's very different and much closer, you could say, to psychoanalysis, where there's a one-on-one -on -one, face to face situation um, where the pastor does not just um, offer you um, forgiveness or a small piece of advice but instead has an ongoing relationship with you about what's going on in your life and how it affects the quality of your life and um, you know, others in your life. So there's like that I find is the main difference um, between psychoanalysis and Christian generally uh, counseling is that depending on which church you go to, um, the person, uh, who is addressing your problems is required by the institution itself to relate to you in different ways, right? I don't know if anyone else has experience in the church this way, but I have experience in both because I was both in the Catholic church and in a Protestant one. Um, and that was my experience with the, with the difference there. It's like, and then uh, we'll get to Alexandra and then Jayati. Um, but yeah, thank you for that that um, that explication of the difference. Because now I'm thinking about it, like where if, when Freud's saying, you know, if you go to an analytic process, you know, you might not reach a deeper understanding of your symptom for two, three, four years. Whereas if you're going to a confession booth, it's like they want to give you you're forgiven for that. Just okay, like just yeah, give do, you some. Do, do your Hail Marys um, and then this particular chapter is closed and you can come back next time with whatever's, uh, you know, turned up since then. Whereas in like pastoral counseling, I even remember there was a sort of a method in, in our church where you put your, your problem or whatever it is that you want to talk about in a box. You are talked to individually by the leader of the church or whoever's leading this counseling session, but then they have further sessions for when you anonymously discuss it with everyone around you. Um, and it becomes more of a, a, a group situation where people can um, 
react or uh, like um, make comments or um, just discuss the problems at hand without knowing who it is that has the problem. So it's like a an extended conf confessional booth, right? Everyone's behind the box uh, and nobody knows who is the one with the problem, but it's also not just one priest that's giving you one solution. You know, Very they're different, like they're, yeah, they're just different formats of similar things. It's the religious version of psychoanalysis or the Christian one anyway. Could we maybe uh, just condense this idea that all of the difference as the difference between master discourse and analyst discourse since but basically on the basic this basis it sounds like the kind of church setting uh, operates on the assumption that the authority person must become a master yes that's great basically, make kind I of think like that's signifier and right whereas, right. As, as, as well there is a nice scene in Freud's secret passion where he really starts to inquire into his theory and form his core understanding of neurosis he starts to saying that yes i am neurotic i mean freud says that he starts to recognize his systems and there's a nice scene he's walking with Freud, and when freud recognizes that he's himself hysteric this is a seminal moment where which Breuer in the movie tries to sort of like overcome by just saying you're just exhausted you're you're just tired you're just blah 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 so it sounds like this type of like trying to appropriate the fertile moment and place some type of like signifier. I'm sorry if that's not too coherent, no, but, but yeah, I just wanted it, to say that. I think it's connected to a really nice point you made earlier, Mika, about the dangers of replacing the fertile moment of truth with the master's ego. Like, I think that yeah. analysis tries to go into the fertile moment of truth, even if it's uncomfortable and emotionally disturbing, as opposed to just saying, let's identify with the master ego. Um, Alexandra and then Jayati. You have your hand. Oh. I don't know if you can. Your sound isn't coming through there, Alexander. Uh, has has uh, she frozen? Yeah, she's sort of frozen. But while we wait, I find it, um, if I could just say, there's also the, um, the patient or the confessor is often uh, comforted by the master's ego for exactly that reason, just because the master is confident in its solution, right? The, the Catholic is happy to go away feeling like the priest knows what he's talking about, whether the priest knows or not what he's talking about, or whether yeah. the priest is even really paying attention to your problem <laughs> at all. Like that's a, <laughs> that is a solution for this, the confessor in, in itself. But I guess what the, I guess what Freud would say is that that's not really a long-term psychological cure. Although what the Catholic would say is that that is um, they would be content with that because it would keep that person's identity aligned with Catholicism. If that like it would it would maintain the adherence, the religious adherence. So I guess yes, like there's exactly. a, that that would be. That would be the university discourse also. There's this reinforcement of the signifying chain. Uh, the master signifier, which is the, the, the dogma of the religion is, is speaking through these chains of uh, these signifiers uh, of sin and lust and gluttony or whatever. And that is then reinforcing the subject as, as barred. So yeah, that, that's the university discourse. So. Yeah, and, and as we know from Lacan's uh, presentation of the discourses, there is an intimate relationship between the master discourse and the university discourse. They kind of hinge uh, upon each other. Absolutely. Um, 
Alexandra, if, if I don't know if you want to try getting your sound again, or uh, if not, we'll move to Jayati. It might be because you've got a headset on, or it might be because you can hear me. Yes, now, now we, we can. can. Okay, sorry, I'm in a mall. Okay, I want to say uh, just the thing. Excuse me for the noise. I want to say that, in my opinion, I'm not. I'm not uh, good enough. Uh, I'm not uh, enough uh, uh, spiritual to judge uh, the difference and the similarities between a priest and um, a psychoanalyst. But in my opinion. Um, even if there are different discourses, for instance, the psychiatrist has his uh, scientific discourse, the priest uh, has his uh, dogmas and discourse, the analyst has uh, his uh, theoretical basis. But uh, in the same time, uh, you, can, uh, you can be, for instance, a psychiatrist who is psychoanalyst and Christian in the same time, or you can be a priest who considers that uh, psychoanalysis is bad or vice versa. So there are singularities, uh, there are singular situations. So in my opinion, in my singular <laughs> more or less opinion, I think that it, the similarity that is very important is to be able to empty yourself. So to empty yourself from your ego as a priest and as a psychoanalyst. Because um, if you are able to empty yourself, uh, then you can listen to the answer. And the answer is coming from the big other. You can call it God or unconscious or uh, transcendental consciousness or whatever. But that's what I think. It's important to empty yourself from your ego and not judging the client or the person who comes to confess. So to be able of offering an unconditional love as much as you can, but not because you are good in doing it, but because you are capable of, of, em of being empty, of being an empty space. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, yeah. um, Sorry, Jayati, no, no. you're saying something. Uh, yeah, St Stanley, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, I, I think that it's sort of like um, therapy in the military, where, um, you know, it's short term. And the difference is that in the military, um, you know, therapy, apart from being short term, and with a soldier being returned to duty quickly. Um, you know, the, the allegiance of the therapist there is to the military, whereas the allegiance of a private practitioner is to the patient. And I always think it's a similar kind of thing with a priest where, um, you know, they always have this allegiance to the church. And so they're, they're whole, they're, they can't be totally concerned with the interests of the patient in that sense. Um, I, I don't know that it's 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 really possible to I mean I, I think in terms of treating someone you have to be a real person but that doesn't mean that uh, you have to sort of share personal aspects of life with the other person I think that's not good you know uh, unless it's you know sort of the kind of thing you'd discuss with a casual friend <laughs> and it's helpful. <laughs> I think the cru I think the crucial point you're making here, at least from and like I tie this together with what a lot of other people yeah, have sure. said about this difference between the 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 Catholic or the confessional and the therapeutic aspect is this, you know, the allegiance to the military or the allegiance to the church over the patient is kind of the allegiance to the big other over the individual yeah. psyche. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what analysis really affirms and really, I think, represents a real modern, you know, development in relationship to maybe pre-modern sort of traditional structures is that it's worthwhile to go into the tensions of the actual individual psyche 
um, to help that individual become more for it themselves, their own telos, as opposed to the telos of the military or the telos of the church. So I think that that's an important distinction. Yeah. Um, Jayati, did you want to uh, jump in? Yeah. So I just want to make a small comment to this difference. It will be interesting to look at Foucault's subject and power, where he's talking about how when we look at this modern power, how it is drawing from pastoral power. And over here, exactly, Kedal, just you said, just what you said just now is when it becomes big other and uh, uh, one can also see the intensification of repression that happens because then one can see that by riding on guilt and forgiveness and there is a release that is happening, one can see that with church, there is this governmentality that is happening, where it is interested in the lives of a subject, where there is a certain kind of control also, where analysis on the contrary requires work, labor, even the labor of the negative. Uh, it's not a, uh, most of the times it's not even a release. If there is a release, there is a tension also. There is a simple work that is involved over there. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, we have, I think we have to understand that the individual psyche in the pre-modern world was really unexplored territory and, and not the primary concern. The primary concern was the governmentality. The primary concern was the continuation of the church structure or the military indoctrination, like, you know, like where you'd have 16, 17, 18 year olds, you know, sacrificed for battle. Whereas in- in the in the twenty first century, we're 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 in the situation where we're going into the tensions of our individual mind in a way that just would not be not be done in the past. Yeah, right. It would be interesting to see that how uh, modern power emerged with pastoral power. Modern power. That is the central argument of Foucault in his entire work. In the present times, what becomes interesting <laughs> is what I wanted to ask also, uh, when you ended up lecture two and you were talking about damming up libido and the frustration and frustrated negativity, one can see that how capitalism is uh, uh, literally riding on it. So the turn away from reality, which is happening, <laughs> Capitalism feeds on it. It's like a beast. Which further, it's, it's getting prospered with that kind of turning away and it doesn't really want us to face the real. It's like you work nine to nine to five, Monday to Friday, and I'm giving you weekends, go out and have party, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, great point, great point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's say, really interesting. Yeah. Go ahead, Raya. No, I just think that's really interesting um, what Jyoti said about the um, the work done in psychoanalysis causing tension. Like I feel like it's it's it causes tension for both parties, the ana the analyst and the analyzand. It's meant that work that is done in a proper session is meant to cause tension because it's not easy. If it doesn't happen, there's no solution really that has been reached. Right. If you go away and neither of you are particularly affected or interestingly, if, for example, the priest is meant not to be affected at all, it's like, yep, I've handed out this absolution or this solution or whatever. But then I go about with my day and I go on to the next one. But I don't really think about what just happened there because it doesn't affect me in any way. I'm here to provide a service to somebody who came looking for the service. But that's not how this work is done. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, I, th I think that there has to be, I don't know, it's, 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 it's a different, it's a difficult one. Like, I, like, I, like, I, I wrestle with, like, if you're a good analyst, you should have already gone through the process of basically dealing with your own unconscious, your own unconscious images and your own emotional vicissitudes so that you've almost reached a psychological place where you can maybe be like what Al Alexander is pointing towards with this empty subject where you're totally empty, but your emptiness is so that you can be genuinely caring about the other patient and their outcome without getting caught up in games of counter-transference. 
Um, I know Osho gave the example, I know he's not an analyst, but like he gave the metaphor of the ocean and the dirty rivers where the patient would be like the dirty river and the analyst would be like the ocean and that the ocean can sort of take the dirty river and sort of um, see the dirty river for what it is and not sort of, again, become a dirty river and get caught up in the games of counter transference with the, does that make sense? Right, right, I understand. Well, that's, yeah, that's exactly what Lacan um, talks about with the analyst discourse where the, the position of the analyst is the objet, the lost object. It's this kind of black hole, this vacuum that is uh, causing the analyst's desire. And even as far back as Seminar 11, uh, Lacan talks about the desire of the analyst as being in this dialectical relationship with the desire of the analyst, such that the, the analyst is within this transferential relationship is, is evoking and causing the desire of the analyst to undergo analysis. Uh, I think Bruce Fink does a really great job of bringing this out in his uh, um, uh, clinical introduction, uh, the first chapter. He, he talks about the the crucial importance of the of the of the analyst to evoke and and, and cause the desire of of the of the analyst, in, which is um, is very um, contrary to a lot of um, modern psychology, modern forms of therapy, which would see the that desire as being um, uh, as as being um, um, problematic in some way. But but yeah, that 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 dialectical relationship between the, the desire of the analyst and the and the, the desire of the analyst, and not in counter transference, but in uh, bringing the analyzant into a proper relationship with the analyst in order so that the, the work can can happen. I feel like I, I, I caught the um, I caught the beginning and the end of your discourse. I really appreciate the um, yeah, it is it to me. I, I love this metaphor of the analyst as a black hole and like that that represents the lost object and the object guy. I think that's super useful way to think about it. Um, Jayati, did you have your hand raised again, or is that just from the past? Oh no, okay. All right, sorry. Yeah, let the. If I wonder else wants if to I wonder ahead, if the Stanley. phenomenon of uh, of okay. counter transference kind of presents a real problem um, for this kind of ideal of the the analyst as a kind of blank slate, uh, because like the analysts presumably will will be affected by the by the patient's speech um, in in phenomenology the the idea is that you know speech itself is well all phenomena are significant um, and that you know that significance uh, it, it's almost like it can't be avoided the the the, the, the analyst themselves is a split subject um, so I guess my question is like what what does the analyst do with that affect the role of affect uh, their own affect um is it is it a kind of putting on a performance of being an analyst of being uh kind of unaffected i think this is like this is such an important question because like um i can only i can only say that from my own sort of personal experiences it's it's if 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 you are deeply intimately affected by the speech of the other it, it becomes it seems very impossible to to help the other person free themselves from neurotic capture because your own sort of neurotic impulses are being triggered i suppose i think that what freud's methods are aiming to do is to reduce that possibility to the most it can be reduced maybe it can't be eliminated completely but to me it means that if you're going through a proper analysis it should be kind of with a cold there should be a coldness to it like i've had some people say to me when they're describing their problems that i'm cold for example 
but it's not it's not cold as in I don't care. It's cold as in I'm not trying to become too reactive that I distract them from their own problem. If that makes sense. There's a type of coldness that has to be cultivated. And I think that in my experience, silence and, and sort of this constant ability to remain present within yourself is, is necessary, not to get pulled out of yourself into the battle, so to speak. I don't know if that's possible. It's kind of an ideal. <laughs> it's not, maybe it's not totally possible, but Alexandra. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, thank you, Benjamin, for your question. Um, because as you said, uh, the analyst is also a split subject. And I think um, one thing what I want to say is that the supervision is also very important because um, um, if uh, the analyst is capable to see uh, what triggers from the uh, client discourse in his, uh, uh, in his uh, person, uh, then uh, he is able to go uh, to a supervisor, and that's very important. This relation, in order to talk about his um, his symptom, because uh, there are two symptoms uh, that meet here. So the supervision, I think, it's very important to have somebody to go and to talk about this uh, counter transfer in an open way. And um, something else, what I wanted to say, I think it's very important um, uh, if you are a psychoanalyst to, to know, uh, to make a diagnosis in a way, not, uh, not uh, labeling, but knowing it's uh, hysteria, it's uh, obsessive compulsion or it's, uh, uh, psychotic break. So it's important to have uh, uh, experience and to, to know uh, in a way uh, what kind of symptom is it. Even if I'm against the classifying, but it can help that the experience of this, the school, how to deal with it. What kind of symptom is it? So a diagnosis, because uh, it's very important to know and to decide the, your attitude and your way of being, if it's a hysteric or it's a obsessive compulsive uh, symptom, it's a difference here or a perverse one or whatever. I think it's. I think it's a really. Yeah. I think it's a really important question here that that Benjamin's raised. Um, it's really. It's really a central problem. Is there, is there anyone else who who'd, who'd like to to give a to take a stab at it? Well, I, I was thinking that maybe one basic notion to take into account is that uh, analysts must always have uh, undertaken a full analysis of themselves. So basically one cannot be an analyst without having undergone a full analysis, right? So uh, what analysis does is it uh, seeks the kind of like uh, lost chapters, one could say, of the history of the subject, and tries to overcome the resistances against uh, reconstructing it in speech. And the way that uh, I think Carol is uh, formulating the uh, process is uh, reminding me of how Lacan says that uh, when the image of the subject is uh, awakened, there is this type of like feeling of exaltation without limits, uh, a mastery of every outcome, uh, in a sense, when one can name 
and experience and speak it. And but Lacon is saying that this is only the first phase, right? This is just the first step towards analysis. Being able to name the uh, chapters of history, which are marked by some kind of limits of the unconscious. And the next step, step uh, Lacan says, would be to uh, get to the bottom of the function of the ideal ich. Recognizing the ideal ich, which is not the same as the uh, ich ideal or the uh, level of the uh, imaginary. Uh, since, as Lacan says, the uh, basis of analysis is always in the symbolic. Just a basic comment. I, I would think that it, it's really clarificatory in this sense. Yeah, I think that at least from the Lacanian point of view, well, yeah, from the Lacanian point of view, you have to, have to go through a full analysis yourself. The idea is if you've gone through a full analysis yourself, you could basically inhabit the analyst discourse. So it's not getting away from discourse or that you're, as it were, totally unmoved by discourse, but that you are sort of capable of you're not getting tricked by the imaginary desire in the same way as some of the other discourses can be. So you can inhabit the position of the object, object as I think uh, Eric pointed to before he left. Um, now, yeah, I think that it, yeah. it's sounding to me that it might be the way that Lacan says the, or sees the first phase of analysis being this type of uh, ability to see the gaps in the imaginary sphere. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, being able to see the gaps in the imaginary without getting, I guess, identified and sort of personally pulled in by the gaps. Because you, you kind of become the gap, like the, the subject as gap, you know, like you, you, as an analyst, ideally you're working from that position. Um, so it's like a perspectival shift on desire. Um, it's, al it's almost like the problem of like becoming a Buddha versus being like b versus making other Buddhas. It's like sort of trans like transcend going through analysis, then sort of helping other people go through analysis. And how do you how do you do that process? Like it's 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 kind of similar to that problem. Um, except that you're doing it within discourse. Um, you're doing it within language. Um, it's really important to think about this, these, uh, these, these, these dimensions. Um, yeah, but to me, it sounds like this would be at the imaginary sphere still. If we are cap capable of becoming the ideal, embodying the ideal and capable of also producing the ideal in the other, it would still, to me, sound like it's in the imaginary sphere rather than in the symbolic. Well, I'm just trying, yeah, I agree with you. I'm just trying to link it to, I'm trying to link it to the idea that in Buddhism, you have kind of like the end of suffering in Nirvana, or like you have this idea that there's the end of suffering in Nirvana um, and that the suffering is being caused by desire. And then in analysis, the ideal analyst is capable of occupying the place of desire without getting caught in the games of counter-transference. If that makes sense. Like, but the only way you can occupy the place of desire, like for example, being the subject of projections of the father imago or the mother imago or the, or the brother sister imago and not get pulled into it or not get sort of involved in it personally is if you've already gone through that process of transcending those images. Not sure. So if there's any any other any other comments or um, ideas, um, say them now because we're going to close up in about about five minutes, um, and I'll give a summary of the two papers.
So if there's any, again, like for me, the two papers, the first paper about transference um, and the way in which transference can be an obstacle or the main resistance to an analytic process and sort of a necessary obstacle to go through. And then the second paper about the onset of neurosis as really being caused by frustrated libido, um, frustrated desire, let's say. I think they, they, they go together really nicely and this has been a really nice, nice discussion. Although I've had some internet troubles, it's been a really nice discussion. All right, getting a heart from getting a heart from Sandra. Yeah. Okay. So uh, seems like seems like we're all we're all set here. I'd just like to 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 again thank you all for your um, attendance, for your um, for your awareness and attention, uh, and for this amazing discussion. I've really enjoyed it. I think it's been really productive. Um, and uh, I will again, as usual, send out a notification on Facebook and through email uh, for the next workshop. If you'd like to be included in the email list for these workshops, just message me on Facebook and I'll, I'll include you. Um, and yeah, that's it. So we covered um, dynamics of transference and the onset of neurosis by Freud from 1912, accompanied by a discussion. And uh, I'll see you guys all in two weeks. Peace out. Thanks, Kadel. Bye, everyone. Thank you.